Hi there, welcome to this UniReach video on how you might carry out your interview in engineering. It's important to make sure it's clear that this is just an example of what an interview could look like. Obviously colleges uh, and universities can change this year upon year, um, so this isn't a one-size-fits-all approach. It's just uh, an example of how you might conduct this interview and then use it, uh, whatever's thrown at you in your, in your own interview. So some key tips, uh, I think it's important to state that you can apply to any interview, regardless of what subject you're doing, is that if you're given a question, make sure you do your working and thinking out loud. What this is meant to be doing is not just testing how smart you are or how good you are at your subject. It's meant to test how you learn and whether how you learn is compatible with the way they teach. And the way they do this is by asking you to undertake your working and your thinking in a way that they can see your line of work. Try as hard as you can to relax, breathe and park your nerves. If you can manage to do that, then it means that your passion for your subject will shine through far more effectively than if you're all terrified, uh, quite honestly. An opening question they'll often start with relates to your personal statement. Make sure you know this inside out because your personal statement is meant to be the things that you are most confident talking about, most comfortable talking about. And it's meant to be a nice way to ease you into the interview and to make you feel a bit more comfortable. Make sure you're able to expand upon what you've said in your personal statement. If you talk about a project that you've done, make sure you can go into more detail confidently about that project. If it's about a book that you've read, make sure you have read it. If it's about a podcast or something that you have uh, researched, then make sure that you are able to talk confidently. Some of the people that are interviewing you may well be people who have written books about this uh, topic or about this field, so they will be able to pull you up if you get something wrong or if you clearly haven't read it. The main element, however, of an engineering interview, at least, is the worked example questions. You will get technical questions and be asked to work through them. So let's take a look at some of these examples. So here we have a velocity time graph and we need to sketch it for a skydiver jumping out of a plane. So the first thing we're going to do is label our axes and then we need to think in our heads what the phases of this would be. So as you're falling, you're going to accelerate, hit terminal velocity, decelerate when you open your parachute, then a new terminal velocity and then hit the ground. I'll explain these a little bit slower, but uh, you have the first, fourth phase, and then the final phase. You need to then be comfortable expanding on what these are. The first phase, acceleration. Why are we accelerating? We're jumping out of a plane, the forces are imbalanced, your weight counteracts the air resistance, and you will accelerate. We're then going to move on to the second phase, Second phase is when the weight is equal to the air resistance, and so you are no longer accelerating, you have reached a terminal velocity. Use the word terminal velocity, they will be very, very keen on it. This will happen when, you, uh, yeah, when the forces are balanced and you cannot accelerate. The third phase is deceleration. When you open your parachute, you are going to massively increase the air resistance that you are experiencing, so the forces will be imbalanced and you will slow down. You will decelerate when the parachute opens. The fourth phase is when you reach a new terminal velocity, because as you slow down, the air resistance will get lower and lower, and then you will reach a new terminal velocity when the weight is equal to the air resistance again. And finally, when you hit the ground, you will obviously be stationary. It's important that you know what terminal velocity is, during these interviews, something that might happen a lot is that you will be asked little side questions or follow-up questions. This is one such question you might be asked, what is terminal velocity? It occurs due to the balancing of forces. When air resistance is equal to your weight, you have reached a terminal velocity. It's the fastest speed you could be going under those conditions. And you can see here um, that, you can see on this diagram, that the weight is equal to the air resistance at terminal velocity. 
when you're accelerating, obviously your air resistance is very small uh, and the, your weight is much bigger by comparison. And as you increase in speed, the air resistance will increase. When you open your parachute, your air resistance is huge due to the huge surface area of the parachute and it massively counteracts your weight. Um, but all of these will eventually come down to a balancing of forces. The next question asks you to draw a graph of sine x over x. Now here, you are not going to need to know what that looks like immediately. But you do know what sine x looks like, and you do know what 1 over x looks like, and we're going to use that uh, in this question. It's important to note there's a lot of graph sketching in these interviews often. It's a very good way of just testing how you think on the spot and how you work something out that you might not necessarily have encountered. So we're going to start by drawing the graph of sine x. And uh, we're going to draw that down. Right here. And once we've drawn our graph of sine x, we're going to overlay it with our graph of 1 over x. And essentially, we are going to use the superposition of the two graphs. We're going to overlay them on one another. So we're going to see what would happen if you essentially added the graphs together and you would be left with this, which is that obviously as you go further from the origin, uh, your 1 over x graph will mean that the, uh, the size of your, uh, of your sine x graph will decrease, in, uh, decrease massively. Now, how do we know, however, that there is a peak at, uh, uh, at the uh, origin? And what would that peak be? The answer is that, that peak would be at 1. And we know this because of L'Hopital's rule. Now, don't worry if you haven't encountered L'Hopital's rule. This is something that you may have done if you do further maths. Not uh, Universities don't have that as a requirement for engineering. Uh, so you don't have to have done this. But if you have done further maths, they may ask you about it. L'Hopital's rule, essentially, is that um, if you have the limit of one function over another function, the limit going to a is equal to the limit going to a of the derivative of that function uh, over the derivative of the other function. It's written out much more plainly there. So if we take fx as sine x, we take gx as x, the derivative of sine x is cos x, the derivative of x is 1. That's how we know that the limit of sine x over x, as you get to 0, is going to be equal to 1. And pulling apart uh, different values uh, on, your, on your graph is often going to be asked as a follow-up question. Again, L'Hopital's rule is not compulsory. You don't need to know it. It's a useful little thing, but you're not expected to know it going into the course. Um, so, so don't panic if you haven't seen this before. Another type of question that you might be asked, however, is a more subjective question. A question that isn't necessarily asking you to draw a graph or do, a, or do any math or draw a diagram. But it's more asking about your thoughts on how you might approach a problem, for example, that's way beyond your, uh, your expertise. These are the tougher questions because there's no one right answer. They're looking for your point of view. But what you need to do is break it down. In these questions, they could literally ask you about anything. I've seen one question which asks you to talk about a light bulb, which is incredibly open-ended. And it's the open-endedness of these questions that often leads to problems and leads to students panicking and not knowing how to answer. Breaking it down is the fundamental step. And what you need to do is to figure out, is to look at each part of the question and figure out how you might tackle each smaller part of that question. Talk about a light bulb is obviously quite a difficult one to break down, however, because it's very short, it's very open-ended. So you look at the word light bulb. Then you can try to think about possible relation to A-level study. Everyone who does physics will have encountered light bulbs uh, in their studies and will know the basic ideas of how a light bulb might work. So you can go from that. You don't necessarily need to know the intricacies. You just need to know, for example, filament gets hot, emits light, you can go and talk about photons if you want, you can talk about photoelectric effect and things like that. There are lots of ways you can go here. 
but a key one is also to listen to hints. If the person interviewing you likes the direction they're going, that you're going in, they might prompt you further. They might ask you to expand on a certain point. They might direct you. They might also do that if they don't like the direction you're going in and they want to guide you to perhaps a more interesting path or a path that they want you to talk about. If you encounter that, make sure you listen to them. Let them guide you. In some interview scenarios, usually for different subjects, sometimes people tend to get a bit argumentative with their interviewer. They like to have a debate. They like to tackle it. That tends not to be the case in engineering. If you are being told that you should explore a different, uh, a different idea in your interview, it's wise to go along with them because that's sort of a prompt that you might not be on the right path or that you are on the right path and that you should therefore keep going. You might also get asked about things called Fermi problems. Now, Fermi problems are very simply problems that are very difficult to give an exact answer to. They're problems of estimation. For example, how many grains of sand is in a pyramid? And so you give reasonable estimations that aim to be in the correct order of magnitude. So how many, how big is a grain of sand? How many grains of sand would be in, for example, one kilometer? How, what's the volume of a pyramid? Things like that. And you're not aiming to get an exact answer. You're aiming to get something that's around about correct. And again, what they're looking for here is an understanding of how you can find your way to an answer that you're not particularly confident in and how you might break down a problem that you're not particularly confident in because over this course you are going to find time that you are not confident in your answers and you're not confident in your problems and they want to know okay is this person equipped to handle something that they may not understand and are they equipped to then persevere and find a way through and that's what you really want to be presenting to the interviewer in, uh, in your interview. At the end of your interview, they might ask if you have any questions for them. You don't have to. Uh, it's not a trick question. They, they aren't checking if you, if you uh, are particularly curious about something. You don't have to think of a question. But equally, keep your, keep your questions professional. Keep your questions uh, on, on topic. Not things like, when am I going to hear my when am I going to hear my result? When am I going to hear if I got in? Things like that. Direct those to the admissions office, not to your interview. Um, but other than that, I wish you luck in your interview and, uh, and hope it's successful.